so I'm coming now to, back to Australia. When we got native title, this is what's on the title deeds in every state. Unused state land. And that there, in reality, is uh, native title is not Aboriginal land rights. So the International Court of Justice, the legal consequences of construction of the wall in Palestine in 2004, the ICJ said that Israel's occupation was illegal. And I think we all understand that occupation of a territory is, in fact, illegal according to international law. However, however, Australia and England and the United States should never, ever say anything or throw a stone against any other country about occupation because they are illegally occupying countries like Australia. The reality is, the law is, they are in occupation of other people's territories here. England are yet to decolonise all those countries that they still hold title to through the sovereign of the English monarch. And so that's what we got to, we're working on as a people. We got our own problems here. We have to deal with that. But we keep saying to them, you people, the Australian government should not have an opinion on, the, on anybody else anywhere in the world because you can't clean your own mess up here. So stop talking about someone else. The full bench of the Australian High Court made a decision in a court case called Tom and Love. And in that High Court case, Chief Justice Kiefer, who gave the ruling, said that Aboriginal people are neither citizens nor aliens. Now that's 2020 people, that's two years ago, February 2020. And so if we're neither citizens nor aliens, and that's what's said in the highest court in this country, well then who the bloody hell are we? Who are we? And what laws in this country control us? What laws? Think about it for a moment. If we're neither citizens nor aliens, then we belong somewhere else. And these people do not have any right to rule over us at all. So, in Western Australia, now, this is a court case, another full bench of the Australian High Court, in 1995, three years after the decision in Mabo, no lawyer who works for native title or works with Aboriginal people will tell you about this case. No one. And the reason they won't tell you about this case is because in this case, the first question was to the High Court, did the establishment of the colonies take away Aboriginal sovereignty and title to our lands and natural resources. The second question was when they set up legislature in each of the colonies with the approval of the British, did that take away Aboriginal lands, rights, our title? Did it take away our sovereignty? Did it take away our rights to the allodial title, that is all our mineral wealth and water? And, the second, and then the third question was, did the establishment of the Native Title Act in 1993 take away Aboriginal people's right to their land and their allodial rights, and did it interfere with Aboriginal sovereignty? And there's two other questions. All the subsequent amendments to the Native Title, did they take the Aboriginal people's rights away? The answer to those questions right up front was no. So if none of that was taken away from us, and that, again, that's a, that's a finding by the Australian High Court in this country, backing up what Mabo has started, well then, if we're not citizens, and if these courts did not take away those rights, then whose law apply in this country? Whose law applies to those lands? There's only one answer, and that is our law. And our problem is we do not know how to make that work. That's our problem. And we'll, but we'll, we'll work through this. If the land were desert and uncultivated, truly terra nullis, the Crown would take an absolute beneficial title, an allodial title, to the lands 
for the reason given in Stephen C.J. in Attorney General v. Brown, and that was 1847. Then they say, but if the land were occupied by Indigenous inhabitants and their rights and interests in the land are recognised by the common law, the radical title which is acquired by the acquisition of sovereignty cannot itself be taken to confer an absolute benefit, beneficial title to the land. Now, so what's that saying to us? This is a decision in Mabo. And so, and that Stevens, CJ, when I looked at that case because they quoted it in Mabo, that case says that Aboriginal people, if the lands are left in the ownership of the Aboriginal people of Australia, then the British cannot have a lodial title to our land. They do not have a beneficial title. They have a registered title only, but they do not have a beneficial title. So what does a beneficial title mean? Beneficial title means that they can make decisions about the land. And these parliaments are cheating their way through in this country, and Aboriginal people are not aware of the wrongs of these parliaments. They do not have the power to do this. And this is another story that we have to get together, and um, I'm hoping that we will be able to come back together to talk about this because it's very important. And so when I looked at this case in 1847, because the Mabo judges referred to it, and so this is what Chief Justice Stevens said. First, the title to lands in this colony is in the Crown. So that's England, yeah? Good old Queen Elizabeth. Equally on constitutional principles, as by the adaption of the feudal fiction, right, and it's very important that we look at that word, fiction, such a title, on either ground is fatal to the idea of uh, lodium. Whether the term implies a property acquired by lot or conquest or left in the hands of the occupation of the ancient owners, that is, the, original, uh, the Aboriginal inhabitants, it equally rejects the supposition of a title in or from the sovereign. But the objection, therefore, is only another mode of disputing that title. And that's what was said in that court case. And that court case, Mabo never overturned it, and no other court in this country has ever overturned that decision. So Marbo, this is what Marbo says, it is not surprising that the fiction that the land granted by the Crown has been beneficial owned by the Crown was translated to the colonies and that the Crown grants should be seen as the foundation for the doctrine of tenure, which is an essential principle of our, of our land law. It is far too late in the day to contemplate an allodial type or other system of land ownership. Land in Australia, which has been granted by the Crown, is held in a tenure of some kind. And that title acquired under the, under the accepted land law cannot be disturbed. Here's my problem with that statement. That's a finding by the High Court. That's a ruling by the High Court. So, this High Court, when they talk about land titles in this country, as you can see from that, they can't tell you what type of land titles is legal in this country. So if the High Court hasn't been able to do that, well then how in the world are we giving way and negotiating with them even on native title? Because they don't have the right, they don't have the title to this country. Now in East Timor-Leste, um, there was something come up because, let me just add this now, we go, I just want to talk briefly, just, just touch on, on all our minerals, our oil, our natural gases, and all our trees, and native flora and fauna. So in the East Timor Leste, the dissenting opinion of Justice uh, Wiramantri, um, Part C, the right of East Timor, East Timor is a territory unquestionably entitled to self-determination. The principle of self-determination, the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources, the reliance of the United Nations resolutions of self-determination, Australia's position in relation to self-determination, the incompatibility between the recognition of Indonesian sovereignty over East Timor and the recognition of East Timor as a self-governing territory. The suggestion clash between the right of the people of East Timor and the right of the people of Australia. And so Australia ended up losing out, thank goodness. Now here, now we turn to where Mabo 
says that Aboriginal law is not a construct of the common law, but the common law now recognise it. So if the common law recognises by the full bench of the High Court Aboriginal law and custom, well then, people, think about this. I don't know whether you know about flags, but if you look on all the parliaments, you look on all the municipal councils, you look on all the courts, you see the Aboriginal flag flying there with the Torres Strait Island flag. Now, in most countries, you would be committing treason to hold a flag on your government buildings because you, you're recognising someone else. You're giving legal recognition to someone else. And in this case, they're giving recognition to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people and our law on this land. So the question then is, why do we sit back as a people and allow them to force their laws upon us when in fact we should be, uh, should be equal sharing of law? You fly that flag, you're recognising our law. You're recognising a foreign people. You're recognising the people. And when you recognise the people by flying that flag, you've got to share the decision-making of this nation with us. Otherwise, take down those flags. Yeah, and do not put up a facade that you have a good relationship with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. They don't. And flying that flag is a misrepresentation. Now, let me just tell you one other thing. As soon as Mabo came about, the American government, um, and we, we get things that fall off the back of a truck here too, yeah? And there was an advice given um, to... Uh, American investors in Australia, particularly in the, in the mineral sector, and that advice was that be very careful in investing in development in Australia, in the, um, in the mineral sector, because the Aboriginal people, if they win land rights, well then you're dealing with the wrong people, and unfortunately you are paying the wrong taxes to the wrong government, and you should be paying it to the Aborigines. And so if the Aborigines win their arguments, then all of a sudden, how do you recover the money that you paid to the Australian government and now pay the Aboriginal people for the resources that you're taking from the land? And that's a very serious issue. It's an economic one. It's big time that we, something we need to talk about as a people, but it's real. It's very real. And here, um, I wear this headband, I, the colour of this headband, because I've been through the ceremonies to become a leader. And you have to learn a lot. And it's taken me 27 years to earn this red headband. And that I went to the deserts and I went out to the people. And these are some of my fellow decision makers who are elders. And these fellows are the Anungu, the Pinjara land, and they overlap into Alice Springs, right down into one eighth of the total land mass of South Australia. And we've just established another council of elders like this, of lawmen and women, not just lawmen, and women. And we've established that in the Pilbara, which takes up 40% of the land mass of Western Australia. And we're now making moves now, and unfortunately, had this COVID not hit, Western Australia would be in a lot of trouble right now because those men have made a decision that we are going to uh, take control. And they've made those decisions themselves and we're in a process now of asserting Aboriginal law on our land and letters have gone out all over the country in Western Australia and in South Australia as well. So the sui generis nature is a law when a special and unique interpretation of a case of authority is found to be necessary. The High Court and Mabar decision found native title pre-existed. British body of law that came to Australia, native title is unique and is sui generis. And Justice Brennan said in delivering the statement, native title, though recognised by the common law, is not an institution of the common law and is not alien by the common law. What does that mean? It means this. Those men, that law that we hold through ceremony, male and female, in this country, that law is superior to the Western law. And so we have to learn how to assert that law on this country. 
That's what we have to do. And we need help to do it. Yes, we do. But we are in a position to do it. And I've been organising people around this country to do just that. And so we are in a position now to start making those rules. And of course, we have a body of people um, that we can work with in the eastern states and we need more and we need to develop a caucus to make sure that we roll this on. But we have to, before we go anywhere in the world to force this issue, we have to get our act together here. On the question of sovereignty, the High Court cannot deal with the issue of Aboriginal sovereignty within the Australian legal system. The, in other words, when we declare our pre-existing and continuing sovereignty as independent states, no Australian court can deny us our rights to do so. This question only be referred to the United Nations to mediate or the UN will refer the matter to the International Court of Justice, just as they did in the Western Sahara case in 1975. But I think we are able to now put together ourselves into a very different position. Now, this is a case in 1837. And none of these, by the way, court cases have ever been overturned because the parliament has never addressed them and they're scared. They're scared to address them. In the Murrell case, Chief Justice Forbes said, if we are to offer them protection of English law, then they should be subject to those same laws. Murrell argued that he was not a subject of the, of the king, but was governed by his own law. And that if he was to be uh, prosecuted under English law as an English subject, then he had a legal right to claim for compensation for the lands that were taken from him. And so this is where we have Australia stuck. Yeah? So if they're saying that we are subjects and that we're part of that common law system, then because they took our land from us, then they've got to start paying us compensation. That's our common law right. And that's what we've got to start looking at as a people under our law. And Australia will not have enough money to pay, but England's already set up a trust account. So Justice Forbes concluded, although it be granted that the Aboriginal natives of New Holland are entitled to be regarded as civilized nations as a free and independent people, and are entitled to uh, possession of their right, those rights, which as such are valuable to them, Yet the various tribes had not attained to the first settlement of the English people amongst them to such a position in point of numbers and civilization and to such form of government of laws as to be entitled to be recognized so many sovereign states governed by laws of their own. So here we have the highest court in the land at that time recognizing that and making excuses to say that we are not civilised enough, but now we have a high court decision affirming that um, from 1847 in the Marba decision and other subsequent matters. Now in 1841, this is a court case that was decided, and again, none of these decisions have ever been overturned or superseded by any other decision in this country. And Justice Willis stated, I repeat that I am not aware of any expressed enactments or treaty subjecting the Aborigines of this country to the English colonial law. And I have shown that Aborigines cannot be considered as foreigners in a kingdom which is their own. He added, Aboriginal people remain unconquered and free, entitled to be regarded as self-governing communities. Their rights as distinct people could not be considered to have been tacitly surrendered as they were by no means devoid of any legal capacity and had laws and usages of their own. Treaties should be made with them. The colonialists are uninvited intruders, the Aborigines, the native sovereigns of the soil. As I say, that has never been overturned by any court in this country. And when they say, have we been recognized um, by anyone? Here, this is the voice of the Crown, because he's the Chief Justice of, that, of the court, and he's recognising that we are the sovereigns of the soil. So people, we have the power in our hands, we just have to learn how to use it. But here in 1841, in that Bon John case, he, he went on, I am here as a judge to declare the right and not to have recourse to expedient. I can never permit the end to justify an undue means 
for the accomplishment. This may be the policy and wisdom of a statesman, but it is little less than treason in a judge. He must not rest the law to his own authority, nor do a great right through a little wrong. John Howard, in 1998, when he changed and amended the Native Title Act, this was sent from a fellow by the name of Dr. Stephen Davis, advising the Prime Minister of these things. He says, the issue of domestic sovereignty is set to dominate future international discussions of Indigenous rights. The decision made by the United Nations, together with the precedents in other countries, would potentially change the map of this country. Land rights and native title in Australia are, are examples of a very dynamic debate which is open-ended and which can be simply linked to an international convention and trends to develop a credible basis for a range of outcomes with far-reaching, irreversible consequences. And so, John Howard was advised by this mob to avoid any information of the Crown ownership of minerals. And so what they said was, preclude both possibilities. New South Wales relies on the royal prerogative to underpin its ownership of the royal minerals, gold and silver. So these people have got no authority to own our minerals at all. Now, a case is likely to be constructed by Aboriginal people on the basis of sovereignty to test the Crown's ownership of minerals. If a case of sovereignty is successful, uh, then there may be a latitude for a claim for compensation in respect of, of at least the royal minerals or a royal royalty paid to Indigenous groups for royal minerals extracted, both past and future. If the Crown ownership of minerals is affirmed in the amendments, then they may well be a case for compensation mounted by Indigenous groups. The states are wary of this possibility and have subsequently encouraged the federal government to avoid any affirmation of Crown ownership. And they're talking about the minerals, gold, oil, natural gas. So as you can see from that, this Prime Minister, John Howard, was advised, be very careful of what you're doing because the Aborigines are ready to come back at us. And they know it. The only people who don't know it is our people. So he then says, Australia tends to take their sovereignty for granted. And this is to John Howard, by the way. From the, and this fellow comes from the Sir Samuel Griffith Society of Lawyers, who are a bunch of Australian um, think tank who are specialists and protect the Australian Constitution and interpret the Australian Constitution. And so he, he, he concludes by this. Australia tends to take their sovereignty for granted. That sovereignty is now being contested. We must become more aware of the issues, the players, and be prepared to defend our sovereignty if we are to maintain it. People, that's almost a declaration of war against Aboriginal people in this country. So those Indigenous land users, it, well, blackfellas say Indigenous land under attack. Purpose of the Ilyus is to take away Aboriginal root title to land, your radical title to land, and remove the burden of title uh, to benefit the Crown. When you do native title in this country, they ask you to validate their past acts, they ask you also to validate intermediate reacts and surrender all future claims to your land and country. And in those Ilyas, they also ask you um, to sign in, sign in the agreement that future acts will be regarded as past acts. The moment you sign that, you're cutting your head off and you're acquiescing to them and you're giving them everything away that you ever thought you owned. Now, this is important because Governor Phillips orders secret order was that he had to operate the colony under um, the rules and disciplines of war. Now those pictures that I showed you earlier, you'll see them, um, that their law, Australia by, by its very nature is still a garrison. They have police here and um, my friend there, Professor Lilienthal, we talked at great lengths about this 
And so Australia, by its very nature, is in fact still a military garrison and they control their police, is still part of the military. And of course, if you have a look at what's happening now, that not many of you may take notice of, but this COVID is being controlled by the governor of this country. He's issuing the orders, the governor general. And you have a military man in charge of the whole thing. Civil society is not running all this COVID stuff in Australia. The military is. And the military is running it under the orders of the governor. And they have this great facade of saying they have this, you know, national caucus of premiers and the prime minister making decisions. They are taking orders from the governor general uh, on how to do this. And that's why you always see your military personnel with police at borders because they work together. Here, Justice Brennan, when he uh, made that decision, this is in Mabo, Mabo decision. In discharging its duty to declare the common law of Australia, this court is not free to adopt rules that accord with in, uh, contemporary notions of justice and human rights. If their adoption would fracture the skeleton of the principles which gives the body of our law its shape and internal consistencies. What we see here is what Justice Willis said earlier was that judges should never arrest the law unto themselves. And what you have here are judges on the High Court of Australia saying that they cannot comply with international justice on human rights and other things because it will fracture their law if they recognise Aboriginal people. So, people, we have a High Court that made a very racist decision here. That's what Mabo is. When you look at that, they said we can't follow the, the international law on human rights and other things. So they made a racist decision. And so when we look at this, this comes back to what I spoke earlier. Uh, King William IV, now this is important. The case of these people is not, uh, has not been wholly overlooked at home. In 1825, His Majesty issued instructions to the governor to the effect that should, uh, that they should be protected in the enjoyment of their possessions. This is Aboriginal people, right? We should be protected in the enjoyment of, of their possessions, preserved from violence and injustice. We must still express our conviction that if we are ever able to make atonement to the remnants of these people, it will, be, it will require no slight attention and no ordinary sacrifice on our part to compensate the evils association which we have inflicted, but even hopelessness of making reparations for what is past would not be in any way lessen our obligation to stop as far as in us lies the continuance of inequality. So the British Parliament um, made a number of uh, very important rulings, but here's something, and this adds to what I've been telling you about our sovereign status and ownership of land. This here is the Pacific Islander Protection Act. Now, a lot of people say, you know, this is a bit of a fairy tale, this thing. It's not. I, when Bush sat with the old ones, and then I came back from the Bush, and I said to, I rang Ellie Gilbert here in Canberra, and I said, I need you to raise me a fare to go to London, ASAP. Because I have to find out something. There's a document floating around in Australia called the Pacific Islander Act, and they're floating around with this year called Section 7 of the Pacific Islander Act 1875. And I wonder to know what the bloody hell that was about. So I needed to go to England to find out about it and find out what that truly meant. And so Ellie came to copy and film and record what I was finding. So I went there, and I'm, the only way you could get into the, Austra into the um, Office of the Parliamentary Library in London is to have a letter from the Queen authorising you to go in there, or the Prime Minister, or the Leader of the Opposition. And one of the good things about working in the UN over time is that you may meet up with some important people who get into important places, and one such person was Jeremy Corbyn, who was the opposition of the Leader of the British Parliament. And so Jeremy had the power, as the opposition leader, to sign a letter for me to get into access to the Parliamentary Library, English Parliamentary Library. And so I got in there, Ellie came in, 
So they gave us this document, this book, and we opened it up and there was that there, section seven. In the Australian version, they leave off the beginning where it says, Queen Victoria and her heirs and successors. So she committed this queen to this here law. Now this law, when I went back and I showed it to Jeremy, and we had a talk about it, and I said to Jeremy, what does that mean? And so he, he, got his, he got a couple of guys in who explained to us that when a queen issues an order in council or a letter's patent, it becomes absolute law. And it becomes absolute law for the place where they say it's going to apply. And in this particular case, it was every Australian state. And here is the 1872 Act, because this had to be read in as one. And it said there, the term Australian colonies shall mean and include the colonies of New South Wales, New Zealand, Queensland, South Australia, Tasmania, Victoria, and West Australia. So that law where she said that she did not claim sovereignty or dominion over the rulers and chiefs of the Aborigines and all their places. No. So I needed to find out whether that law is current. And here, when I was in London, I found this, and we dug it out as well. This is the last repeal of, in 1986, and it coincided with when they wrote the Australia Act. And in this year, repeal statute, it says here, this is an act to promote the reform of the statute law by the, by the repeal in accordance with the recommendations of the Law Commission of Scottish Law Commission of certain enactments, which, except so far as their effect is preserved, are no longer practical utility and makes no other provisions in connection with the repeal of these enactments. That was when they got rid of the last aspect of the Pacific Islander Protection Act. But the most important aspect here is that they did not, they did not repeal the law that was created by that act, as you can read there. So the law that was established by Queen Victoria, that she did not take away the, the sovereignty of the rulers and chiefs of the tribes and their lands, their places, is still law in this country. That's by order of the Queen of England. The necessity of just, uh, for justice through reparations for the native inhabitants was confirmed by King William IV's instruction in 1825. As recorded in the introduction to the report of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Aboriginal Tribes, British Settlements, which was appointed to consider what measures ought to be adopted with regards to the native inhabitants of the colonies where British settlements are made and to the neighboring tribes in order to secure to them the due observance of justice and the protection of their rights. And the compensation is by order of, <laughs> I think, um, Prince William uh, IV also still stands in law. And so we, as a people, have to talk about this and get people and experts to help us guide our way through this because we are yet to make our impact in the international scene. Now, the Pacific Island Protection Act, this is important here. John Howard was a fool, as we know. In 1999, John Howard amended the Criminal Code, Slavery and Sexual Servitude, Act, 1999. And if you have a look at the back of it in the schedules, he tried and pretended that he could pass a law that would get rid of the remaining law and the effects of the law of the Pacific Islander Act, and he quoted it in the schedules in that act. And because the law is, because that there schedule is not part of the internal structure and wording of the act itself, that schedule means nothing. It does not apply. And John Howard, he knows, at least he should have known, that the Australian Parliament had no power to overturn a parliamentary legislation of another country, of England. So they got no chance. That's rubbish. And of course you got stupid 
judges and barristers who think that's important. The 1967 debate, this is very important because, you know, these, Robert Menzies was in fact a constitutional lawyer, Robert Menzies, Prime Minister. And he says, he talks about the removal of the constitution and the power to make laws. But this is what's important here. When he said, and this is what he said in, in the parliament um, in 1965, it has been suggested that the provisions of discrimination against the Aborigines of Australia, I would have thought that the con contrary was the fact. The parliament has given power to make discriminatory laws in relation to the people of any race, race special laws, which would relate to them and not to other people. Laws which would treat them as people who stood outside of the normal grasp of the law, enjoying the benefits and sustaining its burdens in common with all other Australians. People, what they're saying is this. That's another admission in the Australian Parliament that we stand outside of the Australian law. We do. And so in order for them, and I guess, I don't know how many of you have realised this, but you see, that constitution allows them to make laws for us. So I referred to it earlier. We are neither citizens nor are we aliens. But because we are a race of people that they call the Aboriginal race of Australia and the Torres Strait Islanders, they are making special laws up there. So all those laws that they're making about Aborigines, they have to do it because we don't belong to their legal system. We don't. And so those laws they make for Aborigines is about us. It doesn't relate to any other white person, any other race in this country. Those laws they make only relate to us as Aboriginal people. None of their other laws should or can apply, and that's an admission by a Constitution lawyer who was the Prime Minister at the time in 1965. And so the referendum debate went on. We had a successful uh, referendum, and it was, it was very good. It was an outcome, but it was rubbish. This, this whole thing. And of course, Beasley, when we talked about racism, this is what Beasley said when he said, and, and they were talking about, um, we, we don't want to discriminate against Aboriginal people. But Beasley said, but I do suggest that a whole series of discriminatory laws with respect to Aboriginal is necessary. We say that we do not intend to discriminate. And he says, what rubbish. Aborigines have been occupying land in various parts of Australia since time immemorial. Yet, we deny them the slightest entitlement to one square inch of that land and push them off as soon as we find anything of value to a European is discovered on it. At the same time, we content ourselves with this mealy mouth statement that we do not discriminate against Aborigines. And so, as you can see from that, there's a lot of stuff here that we have to unpack. Yeah? But everything is in our hands. The power is in our hands. And it's up to us now to move forward and take the, I suppose, the responsibility for moving forward. And I'll just end with this here. This is 1999. Some brothers from around Australia, a bloke called Kevin Buzzacott, an elder from uh, the Urbana around the Lake Eyre. That thing that I'm playing with on the ground with a spear is the Australian flag. And in the top corner, left-hand corner of that, is the British symbol, because that's, they're the sovereign nation who owns this country. And so they sang that thing in the desert, the old men and women, they sang that thing. They corroborated. Kevin Buzzard God, under our law, we needed to get rid of the evil from this country, evil of colonialism. And so the ceremony was, when he did all that, that spear came out of the desert as well. And all the tribes hung things on it and did their marks on it. And so I can say this now. They sang the evil back, but we sent a message back to England as well. And we sent some evil of our own back to them. We have ways of doing that. And so that spear, believe it or not, I, I knew that there was something happening, but I did not know that spear was coming. I knew I had to get the flag because the flag was under the fire over here for a week, buried in that fire at the Aboriginal Embassy. And so when they dug it up, when they, before I left, they bought it, wrapped it up, Ellie Gilbert wrapped it up in a shirt and they sent her down to Sydney. 
And um, so I'm off to London to do this, to give this flag back to England after the old people had sung it. And I had not known, I don't even know how that bloody thing got there, but anyway, that spear was in a big uh, pipe at Heathrow Airport with my name on it. So I got all my luggage and I'm walking out and one fella tapped me on the shoulder. He said, don't forget your other parcel. And I said, what parcel? And I looked around and he said, that big long thing there. And I had no idea. I, truly, I don't. <laughs> and I said this to earlier. I got no idea how they did it. Anyway, that thing landed there. That spear came with me on that plane. So I, I get picked up and the fellow who picked me up in London, he owned one of those E-type Jags. You know, them long pointy things? And they only have two seats in it. And I've got this massive bloody spear, pipe, and I'm trying to work out, and I've got to drive through London to get to the other side, to the east side. And so, anyway, we got that bloody thing in the ja E-type Jag, wound the window up tight, and we got this E-type Jag with a massive thing hanging out the window, cruising through London. When I got to London to do this ceremony, there was already a black death in custody. Police had killed a young boy in London, and they were having his funeral. So because it was sorry business, I cancelled the arrangement and set it over for another week. And so that, that happened. That gave me time to go to um, Germany and talk with the Green Party because they just got into power in Germany at that time. So I went and met with them. And before she became uh, Vice Chancellor of Germany, I met with um, Angela Merkel. And uh, we had talks about how Germany might be able to assist us and work with us here in Australia. And so I came, then I came back to London and I did the ceremony, singing. Normally you don't have a crowd when you're doing proper secret business, but then you can't tell tourists in London that, can you? So anyway, I started doing the ceremony in front, singing and doing that there, doing the things that I did. And down the bottom you see here these policemen from, um, from Scotland Yard. That's the boss policeman there, look, um, looking, uh, he's standing straight in front of me over there. And that's my lawyer, that's the barrister who came to protect me, just in case these things happen. Now, when I was doing the ceremony, there were people all over me. It was fascinating. And so I'm doing this business, and by the way, it was minus five when I did that. Yeah? No mandui on. And you forget about those things. And then all of a sudden, I heard these drums beating and music playing. And I was wondering what the hell was going on. And so I carried on my business, and then police horses came and started pushing everyone back. And I thought, oh, God, thank goodness. You know, they come and clear the crowd away from me. But no, they weren't. They were clearing the crowd back behind the lines of Buckingham Palace there because it was time to do the changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace. And so those policemen came and said, said to me, um, can you pause this? and finish it later on. And um, <laughs> I looked at him and I said, no, as I would. I said, no, I can't do that. There's proper business here. And they said, how long is it going to take you? I said, um, I'm nearly finished. And then I walked away from him when I had, the, I had the flag there in front of him. And the barrister of mine standing there, was, he started talking to the police. He told me what he said later on. But anyway, the police went, and they never touched me anymore. They never interfered with me. So I continued the business without any of them people. And through those Buckingham Palace gates, I walked across with the spear, and I threw the flag and the spear across the gate into Buckingham Palace. That spear, and I understand that flag, is now sitting in a glass cabinet in Buckingham Palace. Right. Now... What they didn't realise, what they didn't realise is that we did a lot of evil. We sent a lot of evil back from Australia. Now, if you think from 1999 and have a think of all the things that's happened to the royal family since 1999 to now. Yeah? I'd like to think we had something to do with that. Okay, so people, with the UDIs, this is my elders, the Ualia Nation, after I came back. In 2013, 
we brought the elders together and we brought an executive council together and we made a UDI and this is the first time we met to do this as a nation, as a people. So I brought the elders of the four clans of our tribe and I brought the, uh, the young ones who took up uh, the mantle and made government and they did. This is our flag, this is the family and that's our flag that represents, it's a symbol that's taken from the trees, the carved trees. It's a story of creation, the land, the people, ceremony, and language. And of course, that there is about bringing the law into our country, and the white circles around it represent the people sitting, discussing law. And that's my mum. I think she turned 90 soon. That's her grand great-grandmother that she's holding there. And she was one of the survivors of the massacre of Hospital Creek that I spoke to you about um, earlier, in 1848. That old woman died in Brewarren on the Brewarren Mission, Granny Ellen Leonard. She died in 1941. And so we worked her age out to be about eight or nine when the massacre occurred at Hospital Creek. And we were then told by the late Johnny Bishop, an elder, who told us um, before he died that she had a brother and we, I think we might have found him now. I think we found his family and we have to go back to Brewarrina and talk to him. Um, and so she, was, she died when my mum was nine. And so my mum tells a good story. This is where our country is. Yolea, we meet with the Ngimba people in the south, Murawari to the west, who were the first people who, to declare their independence. That's our UDI. And this is our symbol. Daringin means our land. Yeah. That's our um, crest, that's our declaration. If you look here now, since then, Australia's now in a bit of bother, right? The parliament here. Because if you take a close look at these here, these are letters from New South Wales and from the Home Office in Australia, and also from Buckingham Palace. That letter from Buckingham Palace is from the Queen of England. And it's written to me as Gilla Michael Anderson, leader of the Ualia nation. Now, that's from the royal, that's from the monarch who claims sovereignty over this country. That creates exemption for me in this country. And I want all the other people to get their leaders together so we can get the queen to write letters like this to their people as well. Now, the Uwaliai governors, we've really gone through the processes and we did do this. This is an instrument of accession. And we did the instrument of accession, and I'm glad our Swiss representative is here, Switzerland, because, you see, to do an accession to the United Nations and become recognised within the United Nations, you have to do your accession to the president of Switzerland because that's the repository of the accessions. This is the governing council of the Ualia Nation. We also do workshops on governance, about how to do things on country. And of course here, we connecting the song lines across this country. And these are the Anunga women who came across to my mum. And the women are singing the, singing the country with my mum, my sister. And we're doing a lot of business out there. They're ready to come back and do more singing. And so we're now starting to do work on recovering trying to heal our country. And the very first nation who did a universal declaration is our neighbours, the Moriori Nation, and they declared their independence. And here we have, when we first had the New Way Summit, the Gathering of Nations, we, this year, in the old Parliament House over there, we had this meeting in the, the House of Representatives, the old House of Representatives. And here, that man there, um, Mr Nelson, He's one of the elders of, uh, in Central Australia. He bought, for the first time out of his country, the sacred symbol of their law. It's the first time it's ever come out of their country, and we put it in the middle of that little, that parliament house, old parliament house. And that's our law there, that's our symbol, modern symbol, that's an ancient symbol that came out of the desert for the very first time ever. 
and that man had the power because he was the senior law man. And so he brought it to me and we put it together and he said, now we put our law on top of their law, now we make them talk to us. And so I'll leave that with you, thank you.